One of the most successful entrepreneurs in America over the past 50 years is going public with his fourth and final prediction about a scenario he calls America's nightmare winter. You've probably never heard of Bill Bonner, but in addition to owning an interest in businesses all over the globe, he also owns more than 100,000 acres with massive properties in South America, Central America, the US, plus three large properties in Europe. Bonner says we're about to enter a very strange period in America, which could result in the most difficult times we've seen in many, many years. Bonner has made three similar predictions in his 50 plus year career, and each one proved to be exactly right, although he was mocked each and every time. This is why I strongly encourage you to read about Bonner's fourth and final prediction totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together about America's nightmare winter scenario. Get the facts for yourself. Go to americasnightmarewinter.com to get your free copy of this report. Even if he's only partially right, it will dramatically affect you and your money. So again, go to americasnightmarewinter.com for this free report. With just a week left ahead of the 2022 midterm elections, it looks like the ground is eroding for the Democrats here on the political trail. Joining me today to talk about this and so much more is George Gammon of Rebel Capitalist Pro. George, always good to see you. Welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me back. Absolutely. So there's a lot going on. Uh, I want to talk about your thoughts ahead of the midterm elections here. What should we be watching? What's the main game changer here? Uh, one thing I've been watching is the Biden administration has come out with more stimulus checks in an effort to help people better manage their energy bills going into the winter. And uh, for those who understand economics, you realize that this is just going to exacerbate the problem because the way that you fix inflation is you decrease demand and increase supply, and they're doing the opposite. You know, they're giving out these stimulus checks, they're increasing aggregate demand, and then they're reducing supply through the sanctions against Russia, and with the, all this narrative towards a windfall profit tax, and it's creating huge issues that we see pop up in the diesel market. You know, the inventories there are close to an all-time low. You know, 25 days of inventory is all we have left. These are big, big problems, but my point going into the midterms is I think what they're going to do is they're just going to try to buy votes any way they can. And uh, if that's through just giving out money that's going to make these problems that we have in the economy worse, that's exactly what they're prepared to do. And, and you know, speaking about that, it's a huge amount, $13 billion in aid um, to, to families to help lower their energy bills. I mean, why, why release that now? Well, I think you called it because of midterms, because it makes them look good and it's all just political theater. And because the, the average Joe and Jane looks at that and says, well, yeah, George and Danielle, I mean, of course, they're gonna give them uh, free aid. I mean, this is the humanitarian thing to do, but they don't understand economics and they don't realize that by helping them with their energy bill, you're just hurting them with their food bill. Uh, there, there's, no, you know, there's no free money here. So if you're going to reduce the cost by giving people money for X, you're going to increase the cost of Y. So on net balance, over the long run, it's just going to put them in a worse position. You think we would have learned this back in 2020 when we shut down the economy, we did all these lockdowns, these governments, these central planners, these authoritarians, and then they gave out these stimulus checks and it caused what? Inflation. So the poor and middle class are worse off today than they were in 2019. But now what these politicians are trying to do is just double down on the same bad policies that created the, pro the problem in the first place in an effort to buy votes. It just goes to show you, Daniela, something I talk about on my channel all the time, that you've got to come to the conclusion that these politicians are either stupid or evil, or maybe some of them are both. Because you know that the Kamala Harris's of the world and the, and the Bidens and these other people, they know that this policy, using this one as an example, is going to make matters worse. But they do it anyway. So why would they do that? Be, the only conclusion you can come to is that they either don't get that the policy is bad or they know the policy is bad, they're doing it anyway 
because they're just plain evil people, because they have no moral North Star. They're ethically bankrupt. And that's the, 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 the group of characters we're dealing with right now when it comes to the politicians, not just in the United States, but all the bureaucrats with the EU and the global elite at the World Economic Forum, the IMF, the UN, etc. And I want to talk more about that, but, you know, I'm just... You know, it's such a, you just leaves you scratching your head, really, George, because here's the Fed doing everything possible to fight inflation, and yet we keep releasing these type of bills. Yeah, and uh, I, th I think where this goes, Daniela, just for your, your viewers going into 2023, there are no certainties, yeah. only probabilities, but my base case is there's going to be a political push to prevent Jerome Powell from continuing to raise rates. Now, I'm not talking about today or, you know, in the next quarter, but going into 2023, they're going to try to prevent him or pressure him, let's say, to stop raising rates. This is assuming that we still have this inflation problem and we haven't had a deflationary bust between now and then with the stocks and the housing market, et cetera. But then I think what they're going to argue is, OK, stop raising rates. But the way we're going to tackle inflation is by giving stimmy checks like we're seeing now, mm -hmm. to help people afford the higher prices. And we're going to institute price controls, just like we had in the 1940s and just like we had in the 1970s. So we're going to stick it to those greedy capitalists who are increasing prices to crush the poor and middle class by capping the amount of price increases that they can actually implement. We're going to take their profits away from them. So I think this is kind of the, uh, the battle cry that you're going to hear going into 2023. Again, to be clear, let's stop Jerome Powell from raising rates or these central bankers globally. Let's go ahead and institute price controls and then give people free money to afford the price increases that we've had up to this point. Because at the end of the day, to benefit whom? Well, it's going to do a, a few things. Number one, it's going to be able to buy votes for, you know, it's, it's like Jim Grant always says, uh, the politicians, they're the arsonist and they're the firefighter. So they're the ones that create the problem of inflation, but then they can come in on their white horse and say, hey, we're going to solve the problem with these price controls and giving you free money. And then, you know, the people say, oh, well, that sounds good to me. Where do I sign up? And then they go ahead and vote for them. I think that's the angle here. But I, I but let me actually let me add to that because I think there's also a uh, a Cantillon effect component of this. I mean, I don't know if you saw in the news recently, but this new gal up in uh, Calgary, I think Smith mm -hmm. is her name. She's the new premier up there. She just got rid of this agreement, mm -hmm. this consulting agreement that they had with the World Economic Forum. And of course, yep. she's being uh, called a conspiracy theorist and all these things. Well, why on earth did the government, the Canadian government, had a consulting arrangement with the World Economic Forum? And you say, well, George, what was the consulting arrangement about? It was a health consulting agreement. So, and I, and I don't know the details. I don't know if there was payment toward the World Economic Forum. I, I would assume that there was, but this is how these things work. They, the, the politicians come out and say, hey, you know, we're going to go ahead and spend all this money, but we're going to hire these consultants, these global elite. We're going to hire Klaus Schwab as a consultant. And then if there's a $13 billion program, you know, Klaus ends up getting a billion of it, let's say. And then you say, well, what, George, what's the incentive for the politicians? Because Klaus has all of the politicians uh, under his influence, and he's able to help them get elected. So you hear him come out and talk uh, and brag, quite frankly, about how Trudeau and, and, and Putin was in his young political leader program as well, and Angela Merkel, and I think Macron was in there. And so he's saying, yeah, we got all these people that we influence in political positions of power right now. Okay, well, now those people are going to pay Klaus back for getting them elected in the first place with all these boondoggle programs. So this is the scam that's going on right now. And it's something that just most people aren't aware of. And, you know, I don't know if you follow this, but the Trudeau government announcing um, that Canadians will get a, a GST uh, tax break uh, this week. So those checks are in the mail uh, in Canada as we speak, George. 
Yes, and we've seen the the Christina gal, I forgot her last name, she's in charge of the IMF, and we've seen Rebecca, ironically enough, her last name is Greenspan, spelled a different way, but she's in charge of the UN. They have also echoed these same uh, narratives or these same um, kind of strategies, if you will, and that's let's stop the central bankers from raising rates, let's go ahead and implement what they're calling targeted price controls. So you know, and that's- I wanna- Go ahead. Please. Oh, well, this, that's why they just it shows that they're treating the average Joe and Jane like just like they're complete morons, you know, that they're just the, the hoi ploy down there, just the plebs, uh, that they can convince them of anything that they say. Uh, and this is just a, a perfect illustration of that, that they, that they can, you know, come out and argue that, oh, we don't have to raise rates, that we can just issue more and create more aggregate demand, and that you're just going to buy into that, just like a just like a, a sheep or some lemming march, you know? Uh, George, I want to get back to your point where you said that they will prevent Powell from, from raising rates. When you say they, are you referring to the current administration and is that tied to yeah. a political agenda with the presidential election? I think so. And uh, again, this is the, it's like they all get a script and you see them saying the same things. And this is why I'm very confident that they'll start using that same script here in the United States. And because, to my earlier point, uh, we've seen the UN talk about this, we've seen the IMF talk about this. And you know, I don't know how it works behind the scenes, but to think that there's not a, a significant amount of influence that's placed on the Federal Reserve and Jerome Powell by the administration, I think is completely ignorant. I, I think it, it, it's obvious, yeah, they, they might be, have some struggles back and forth, but at the end of the day, I think the Fed is going to do whatever the administration wants them to do. And if that's stop raising rates and implement so they can implement price controls and do more deficit spending, I think that's pretty much the, the highest probable outcome. Which do you prefer? Now, I know based on your cap, it would be to end the Fed. That would be your ideal scenario. Uh, but do you welcome a return of, of QE or do you think that more tightening is needed? What, what scenario do you want? Price discovery. Daniela, look, <laughs> they're trying to What's micromanage that? the economy. We <laughs> already know how to manage an economy. The, the best way to do that is through prices. They, they always talk about increasing liquidity. Listen, we don't have a problem with liquidity as long as we allow a clearing price. So let the free market create the price of money, just like we did in the 1800s when we had free banking which I'd like mm -hmm. to remind everyone that the prices from 1800 to 1900, 100 years went down by 50%. And this is with fractional res reserve banking, but you just had the government out of it. We actually were able to determine what the prices of goods and services, including money, was supposed to be set by the marketplace. So all of these problems that the Fed is trying to fix whether it's inflation, whether it's QT, QE, you know, the Treasury's coming out now, Janet Yellen, and saying that they're going to do a, a bond buyback program or a debt buyback program. It's basically an operation twist. And they're saying, oh, we've got this problem with liquidity at the long end or with the off-the-run Treasuries, and we need to replace them with more on-the-run or, or bills. L again, just let the prices set themselves and it's gonna handle all of these issues. Now, will we go through some significant pain from A to B? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But you can't get the heroin addict back to a, a place of normalcy, back to a, a sound footing without a little bit of withdrawals. And that's what we need to go through as a society. But that's, it's a very easy problem to fix. Just go back to free market capitalism. I want to bring up an article I read with great interest. It was an op-ed in the Boston Globe, actually, centered on the BRICS, right? Um, and they basically say there's a, a new sheriff in town, or at least a new applicant. And it talks about how the BRICS are gaining steam, gaining momentum, gaining power, and could we see a rebellion against the U.S. and Europe? Is it already happening? And and I just want to you know, add this for, for context. BRIC was coined in 2001 by Goldman Sachs, who saw Brazil, Russia, India, and China as emerging titans. South Africa joined in 2010, hence the term BRICS. 
The group will hold uh, a summit in Cape Town where leaders of the five countries may accept Saudi Arabia's application uh, to join. That would increase the power of a bloc that already represents 43% of the world's population and one-fourth of the global economy. I'm curious to get your thoughts about the growing strength and momentum of the BRICS here. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to who has the power? The people that create the pieces of the green pieces of paper or people who control the energy and commodities? You see, for several decades, uh, the financial economy, you know, in the West, has uh, had all the power. But now I think what you're seeing is that these BRIC countries are starting to kind of scratch their head and say, why should we play by your rules just because you print green pieces of paper? Uh, that doesn't make any, or because you have the euro and that's a, a good currency. No, listen, we have all the stuff you need. We have the oil, we have the nat gas, we have the, the fertilizer. So why should we play by your rules? If we have the stuff that the whole world needs, we, we need to flip the table here. We need to flip the script. I think that's exactly what they're trying to do. And, and this will be a fight that the U.S., I assume, will not you know, give up lightly. What weapons could the U.S. use? I think they've already shot their weapons from the standpoint of what are you going to do? You're going to take them off swift? Okay, that doesn't do anything. You're going to issue sanctions? Okay, that doesn't really do anything. When they've just got all these other customers like India and China they can sell to. I'm obviously talking about Russia. So I, I don't know what they can do other than just try to start World War III and, uh, and create a, a nuclear war. And uh, it, I mean, I hate to go down that path. Right. Uh, but we see this type of rhetoric becoming more and more commonplace with the mainstream media and the politicians in the West. And I think that's a, a direction we could be headed. You know, it's interesting. I, I read uh, Ray Dalio's last book, and he said that what you see throughout the course of history when empires rise and empires fall mm -hmm. is the empires that are in decline always realize that it, it behooves them to go to war sooner than later. Because if they wait too long, then they're going to get completely wiped out because, you know, by definition, they're in decline. And the uh, empires that are on the rise, they, they tend to hold off a little bit because they know that they're gaining power. So I think this could be what we're seeing play out in geopolitics right now. Because, you know, mm -hmm. let, let's look at the, we go back to that diesel shortage. You know, you say, what can the United States do? So hopefully we can solve these problems and we don't have to solve the problems by having a, a GFC 2.0, which would just reduce demand to a point where the demand supply was in equilibrium. But if, if, if we can't, and because these issues are definitely structural and they go back to the sanctions, they go back to the lockdowns as well, where we put all the refiners out of business. So now we're having to pay the, the piper here, right? But let's just assume that you go to a world that's not too far off where the United States has no diesel. What does that, how do you get your food, right? H how do you heat your house if you're in the Northeast? I mean, you sit there and, and people say, oh, that's kind of a conspiracy theory, uh, you're fear mongering. No, you're not, you got 25 days left. And that could <laughs> possibly go down to zero. And if it goes down to zero, now all of a sudden you're, you're literally living in a hellscape. It's like a zombie apocalypse. And we're right on the brink of that because we're having to find out the hard way that green pieces of paper don't matter as much as energy, commodities, food. And I guess, you know, as final thoughts here as we wrap, um it's something that I know you've been talking about a long time. You tweet about it. You say, if you still think, talk of a reset or, you know, are just conspiracy theories, it's, it's time to wake up because it's, it's all unfolding, George. This is, it's happening now. Yeah, it, it's right in front of your eyes. If you're one of those people, like, the, you know, we go back to the premier in uh, Calgary, and she's saying, hey, I want to get rid of the, the World Economic Forum. Why are we having a health agreement with them when th they're not health officials, right? And the pushback to that is always, well, you're a conspiracy theorist, you're a conspiracy theorist. But I think those people that are kind of using that term now uh, haven't come to the realization 
of just what's right in front of their face. You know, I tweeted out the other day that it's just like them uh, calling people who are, instead of flat earthers, people who believe the earth is round, calling them a conspiracy theorist. You know, that, that's at the, where we are right now as far as the political debate. And Daniela, you know as well as I do, and I think everyone watching your, your show right now realizes that today, in today's world, conspiracy theorist just means you're a critical thinker. And it's just like, you know, protecting democracy means increasing censorship and dangerous ideas just means unapproved ideas. I think there's a lot of truth uh, in that, George. Um, I know you got to go, um, but I want to know and the people want to know <laughs> assets. Is there anything you like right now in this insane environment we're in? Yeah, absolutely. T-bills. I just bought some for my own portfolio yesterday, uh, six month T-bills. Uh, we go back to the yield curve right now. And yep. when the yield curve inverts with the two and 10, so two year and 10 year, this is a very powerful indicator, but it doesn't give you a lot of timing, right? It's, it's pretty much 18 to 24 months, you're most likely gonna have a recession, 95% probability, call it going back to the 1950s. But when the three month, inverts with the 10 year, that's more of a timing tool. And usually that means that you're right in a recession or you're headed there very, very quickly. And if we go into a recession, I think there is a high probability that the Fed pivots, especially if there's an, uh, a, a, a disorderly decline in asset prices, you know, not a soft landing, but a hard landing. And, uh, you know, you can get a, a six month T-bill right now for about 4.5%. And what I'm doing personally is I'm keeping my dry powder in that type of T-bill because long term, I want to buy commodities. I think that we are in a, in a super cycle that will last for probably 10, 15 years, but they're expensive. They've run a long way. So it's not like I'm a buyer at this price. I'm waiting for them to come down. I've got a watch list set up. So with you this You wouldn't buy gold at this price. Gold, uh, well, I always buy gold because it's insurance, so I bought it at any price. But more, but I think a better question is the gold miners. And uh -huh. uh, yes, now I think it could be a good time to buy gold miners and Bitcoin as well. Because again, I think that three month inversion with the 10 years telling you that we're closer to a Fed pivot, uh, a lot closer to a Fed pivot, in which case, again, I like to dry powder uh, in T-bills because you get a pop if the Fed lowers rates and then you can take that cash, buy commodities, or for those who like Bitcoin and gold miners, now might be a good time to consider buying. So cheap uh, on the gold miners at least. Um, okay, final thought, final thought. We saw the implosion, Amazon, Facebook. On the flip side, we have companies like Ferrari, George, raising its 22 guidance again on red hot demand for sports cars. Yeah, yeah. So what do you make of this juxtaposition? Are the rich just getting richer and the poor getting poorer? What does this tell us? Yeah, I mean, it's very consistent with an economic decline and a, and a decline in, in an empire, really, quite frankly, whether you want to look at that as just the United States or the West in general, uh, where you have the rich getting even you know, richer and richer and richer, and they're able to afford all the brand new Ferraris while the middle class gets completely decimated. So this is not a good sign for the economy. I mean, I would look at the shipping companies saying that, hey, we're, we're going to have some tough times coming up. Or I would look at the Amazon uh, just you know, giving horrible, horrible guidance or the Netflix. This is telling you what's happening to the poor middle class. And at the end of the day, that's what matters when we're trying to figure out what's going to happen to economic growth. Yep. And uh, yep. again, going back to the yield curve, I think regardless of what Ferrari is doing or Bentley or Rolls Royce or anything, uh, the bottom line is there's an, an extremely high probability that we will go into a very significant recession going into 2023, call it the next three months, six months, nine months, in which case the Fed will most likely pivot. And uh, that, that's going to be great for investors because if you're really paying attention, that should provide you with some great opportunities to buy in things that I think you'll want to hold long term, such as those commodities, Bitcoin, gold miners, et cetera. George Gammon, I know you got to go. 
but I appreciate your time. Come back anytime. It was an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. We'll have more incredible content coming your way, so be sure to stay tuned to Daniela Cambone's show here on Stansberry Research and sign up at danielacambone.com so you stay on top of all these awesome interviews. That's it for me. Thanks for watching. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.